This woman was in prison for 50 years, okay? The nerve of him to ask her, the last known person to be seen with his son, did you kill my son? The pretenses behind her attempting to clean any part of this crime scene. She had been accused of killing her husband by way of poisoning him. Yeah, after that I, I get out, I walk home. That confession was a joke. I mean, he could have said anything. He could have said anything, and there have, would have been no proof. Every time we see something like this, where it's like, there's no care or like regard. Why would you cover for this man and allow him to leave the scene of the crime and act like he was never there? This call and your telephone number will be monitored and recorded. Right now, like the guys looking out there's no windows talking. I don't want to be emotional. I talk to you on the phone. Yeah, I'm sorry. You know, your yeah. Yeah. All, all the bullets. Yeah. All the people ready to somehow read your emotion negatively. I don't know what they are. Yeah, you didn't tell it. Why'd you come from a long line of stoics? Hey guys, what's up? It's your girl Kelly. We are back with another video. If you guys are new to the channel, please subscribe. And if you are into true crime stories, news, politics, and so much more, and if you're a returning listener or subscriber, thank you guys so much for being a friend. I really appreciate everyone who's watching this video. So we're going to be getting into the uh, Scott Peterson, the murder of Lacey Peterson, and this newest development that has come out recently about the potential of a possible new trial and the Innocence Project of LA taking on Scott Peterson's case. This has been a huge bombshell and it really brought me down a rabbit hole with this case. Real quick guys, so I'm editing this video and it's taking me um, just about forever. So I really hope that you guys enjoy this and I pieced a lot of it together after doing research on over a span of multiple days worth of boarding and editing. So it was a labor of love and if there's any glitches or anything like that, I do apologize, but I hope you guys enjoy it and uh, subscribe to the channel if you want to see more like this. So I wanted to come in here and get into it with you guys, get y'all's opinions. Y'all let me know what you guys think. Um, what are your initial thoughts? Like your, if you have any preconceived notions about this case, let me know in the comments before. And then after you watch the video, let me know if anything changed. And I would really appreciate your feedback. Lacey Denise Peterson was born May 4th, 1995 in Escalon, California. Her mother was Sharon Anderson and her father was Dennis Robert Rocha. And Lacey had an older brother who was Brent Rocha. Scott Lee Peterson was born October 24th, 1972 in San Diego, California to Lee Arthur Peterson and Jacqueline Jackie Helen Latham. Scott was their only child together. Scott and Lacey Peterson at first glance appeared to have a picture perfect life. Young, beautiful wife with a million dollar smile, often seen in photos beaming up at her tall, handsome husband, their first child growing inside of Lacey's belly every day. They were the epitome of the all-American family dream, both from affluent middle-class families. Theirs was a life most people could only dream of, yet somehow it turned into a nightmare that would grip the nation for years to come and leave people in shock and awe as to how this young, beautiful, eight-month pregnant woman would seemingly vanish one day. And the truth that was beginning to unravel from the Peterson's tragedy was a situation no one could have ever fathomed. Lacey was an outgoing, exuberant young woman. Her all-American good looks made her both extremely familiar to people and relatable, but also made her stand out in a way that could not be ignored. Scott was charming and had classic good looks as well. An avid golfer, he would later be described as an intent listener and stoic, which one could argue made the two of them fit together perfectly. Lacey, who loved to chatter away, and Scott, a sounding board, who was easy on the eyes. Lacey would be the first one to make a move by asking a friend of Scott's to pass along her number, which he initially blew off. But Lacey was not the type of person to accept defeat. She later came back to the cafe where he worked and asked him herself why he hadn't called. Scott, taken aback by this, placated Lacey by telling her he thought she was playing a joke on him. They later agreed to go out on a date after this second interaction and the rest would become history. 
after two short years of dating. They were married on August 7th, 1997. Prior to getting married, they were also both studying at California Polytechnic State University. After finishing school and getting married, the Petersons invested in a hamburger restaurant for a short time and they operated that business for two years. Shortly after getting married, they ended up relocating and purchasing a house in Modesto, California, where Scott worked in sales and Lacey worked as a teacher. So this was in the year 2000, and by 2002, Lacey found out that she was going to be expecting her first child and was completely overjoyed because this had been something that Lacey wanted very much. So come winter of 2002, Lacey was nearly eight months pregnant and they had decided to name their first son, Connor. So by this time, they had their house in Modesto, California, a dog named Mackenzie, and were over the moon excited about their first child, at least Lacey was. But things would all change on Christmas Eve of 2002, when Lacey, who was eight months pregnant at that time, disappeared and was never heard from again, which, if you can imagine, would be an absolute nightmare for anyone, any husband, who is expecting his first child with his wife, his young wife, beautiful wife, and this would cause complete and utter devastation to anyone who was going through a similar situation. And many people speculated after this that that didn't appear to be the case for Scott. And it would later come to the public's knowledge that Scott was actually in the midst of having an affair and was considering leaving Lacey for this new woman who was named Amber Fry. So December 24th, 2002 started off as a normal day for the Peterson family. Lacey and Scott both woke up that morning and according to Scott performed their normal routine of eating breakfast and he later would go on to describe how they were watching TV together and were actually watching an episode of Martha Stewart before going to his storage unit where he was going to be doing a bit of work and then he decided that he was going fishing in the afternoon after stopping by his office and Lacey had plans later that day as well of course it was Christmas Eve so she had much to do and in the morning while Scott was at his office he was she was going to go for a walk with the dog to a local park that she frequented before and this was a normal routine activity for Lacey who even though was eight months pregnant enjoyed the mild exercise at times even though it was partially frowned upon by her doctor but she felt up to it on that day supposedly according to Scott but there would be much debate later on during this trial and in the subsequent investigation as to whether or not Lacey had ever even gone on this walk with the dog. This would become one of the main issues in this case that would act as sort of a breaking point in getting to the bottom of this investigation and uncovering the truth about what happened to Lacey Peterson that day. Scott Peterson is many things, despite what you may or may not think of him. It is in the best interest of Americans as a whole to fight for the standards of justice and not allow human biases to prevent or circumvent justice or retribution in any way. Scott was a cheater, a liar, manipulative, cold, aloof, and guilty of many other things, I'm sure, as we all are. However, the question that is exceedingly important and is often forgot when people speak of true crime cases that draw at the heartstrings and highlight the atrocities human beings are capable of, a question that is imperative we not only safeguard but insist on getting a truthful and thorough response to in lieu of letting emotions take over is true determination of guilt or innocence. Did reasonable doubt exist, and did the state, who we have granted ultimate authority to deprive human beings their life and freedom, actually prove beyond any doubt that Scott Peterson is guilty? Did they explore every avenue? Did they attempt to make a narrative that was not there? Despite your preconceived notions in regards to this case, I will present evidence from both sides of this argument and we must really begin to do some soul searching in this country if we want to maintain a system of justice that works and we can feel good about. It may not be comfortable for people to look at Scott Peterson's behavior and his actions which made him universally hated and show him grace and mercy 
and declare him innocent, if he is in fact so. But in this day and age, where it seems like we live in an alternate reality, where people can hold extreme opposite views on what they believe to be factual evidence and be certain they are right, just as certain as someone else believes they are 100% wrong. We live in a time where young people growing up don't recall the media sensation that was the Casey Anthony case, and many who only saw a recent docuseries put out by her that was completely skewed to her lies and have gone on to believe that she is innocent and will defend those points. If one were to stumble too far down the Reddit rabbit hole, you can find the most abhorrent of people being defended online by those who will swear up and down they know something you don't. If there are people that would make excuses for someone as morally bankrupt as Chris Watts and Casey Anthony, then it would not be hard to fathom Scott Peterson armchair detectives exclaiming there's more to this case. Plus, Scott never faltering on his own innocence, and with the stunning turn of events that is the Innocence Project of Los Angeles, recently announcing that they will be taking Scott's case, you have to wonder, is there more? I will show you guys just some of the most convincing pieces of evidence from both sides, and I want you to really consider and ask yourself whether reasonable doubt exists. After many hours going over this case and doing research, I realized I never really knew much about this case at all. Just the media narrative. And this case really did take me on a roller coaster ride that I will share my final thoughts at the end of this video on where I stand. But one thing I can say is that after spending any length of time listening to key players in this case and getting to know Lacey through them, it really is easy to see how much of a force Lacey was. Something about her will pull you in, and even after her light was stamped out, she is still able to shine through, and I cannot understand how anyone would want to take her precious life. At eight months pregnant, a vibrant, beautiful soul carrying life seems unimaginable and proves the depths of humanity and shakes you to the core, knowing if something like that happened to her, then what could be possible for anyone I know or love or even myself? And I think this is what really struck a nerve with people in regards to the Lacey Peterson case and what made people so drawn to her and to seeking justice for her. Let's start with the moment that sparked everything, the search, the theories, the whole case, Ron Gransky's 911 phone call. My son-in-law called. He's been playing golf this morning at 9.30. My daughter's been missing since this morning. She's eight months pregnant. She took her dog for a walk in the park. Mm -hmm. The dog came home with just a leaf shot. You guys had any problems? Uh, marriage problems? No. Everything's good? Mm -hmm. You've been married four years? Yeah. Four or five. Yeah, thank you. This is five. So you're married in '97. What concerns me the most is the fact that your dog came home with a leash on. That bothers me. I mean, yeah. no question. Yeah. Um, you know, what concerns me most is doing anything I can to further progress. I appreciate this. that, and I don't want you to hold. I don't want you to hold it against me. I mean, sometimes I hate asking. You got to do it. But I, I do, I really do have to do Aside it. Aside from him having trouble remembering when he got married, which is, you know, not that great, that kind of nonchalant, casual, almost aloof attitude when put, when his, her, his wife is missing didn't really go over so well with people. And some say that maybe he tried too hard to come off as innocent. The Oscar goes to... And the Oscar goes to... And the Oscar goes to... And the Oscar goes to... In the morning, I've been taking the dog down to the park where she walked. And that's, that's like our time. And they say that's time together. When he began to cry, and something I thought was, was very strange was most men, I would expect, even women, will try and wipe away tears. And he, he sat there and let those flood uh, without ever reaching up. That just kind of goes to what we had expected all along what with him. Uh, I mean, mean, here's somebody, he, he wants people to see those to tears. I mean, he, he, I, I would TV. imagine it probably took some effort for him to squirt those out. You know, let the camera roll and let's capture those. And maybe that's going to help me later on down the line. No. 
I, I think that's stupid. When people say that, it's like, oh, you want people to see your tears. Bitch, if tears are falling from my face, you're either going to see them or you're not. Like, to me, it's like he's on live TV. He's on TV. He's doing an interview with Diane Sawyer. He's visible. We see him. It's like, who cares if he's not wiping his tears? I don't know. People have such weird arguments. and I mean, I do too. I'm people, obviously, but I'm just saying. Thanks. How do you, um, two parts, right? How do you envision breaking it up? <laughs> That's kind of weird. <laughs> Such a, he's such an oddball. Going to um, speak to the press this coming when? week. I'm on. debating on when it should be okay. done because Tuesday is the um, State of the Union address, and I want maximum coverage. Okay, girl, whatever <laughs> he wants, maximum coverage. All righty then. I mean, he's uh, one thing you can say about him. He's fucking weird. Okay, and he's sketchy as all get out. But I think he, he might just be a piece of shit person. I don't know. He might be a killer, too. I'm not ruling anything out. I'll let you guys know in a second how I feel, or at the end how I feel, but I want to get into this very, <laughs> one of the weirdest moments I think any of us have ever seen on television, and it is a, it, one of the most explosive moments from this case. I think everybody sitting at home wants the answer to the same question. Did you murder your wife? No, no. I uh, just not. And... I have absolutely nothing to do with her disappearance and, and use the word murder and yeah, I mean that is a, a possibility. <laughs> I'm sorry, a what? Hello? Hello? Um, so, the, okay, so weird, so sketchy, it's like, and you say murder, with a smile, and you say murder, well, <laughs> yeah, that is a possibility, I guess. It's like, what? She asked you specifically, though, did you murder your wife? And it's a possibility that you did? I mean, the answer to that should be unequivocally no. And, you know, why would you even think about that? Why would you even utter that phrase? You know, and I'm not saying that this proves his guilt, but it just proves how much of a odd bird he is and how bizarre that was to say that, to utter that on live TV. And I, I'll never understand how he did not have some sort of legal guidance in these moments where somebody was either sitting in the interview with him or advising him not to do this because it's like, I mean, she asked a very clear and concise question. Did you specifically murder your wife? He's like, oh, it's a possibility. Okay, girl. Um, it's not one we're ready to accept, and it creeps in my mind late at night mm -hmm. and early in the morning. Okay. And during the day, all we can think about is the right it's resolution all he about. to find her. It's literally all he thinks about is her, the possibility. Well, okay, I'm just but as you know, increasingly, now. in the public, suspicion has turned on you. Yes, definitely. Did you ever hit her? Did you ever injure her? No, no, my God, no. Um, violence towards women is oh God, yeah. Tell me about it. unapproachable. It is the most disgusting it is act horrible. to me. Um, and I know that uh, <laughs> suspicion has turned to me. And it's, um, it's turned to me, one, because I'm her husband. And that's a natural thing. And I've heard all the statistics on all the news shows about that being, you know, someone that uh, a husband, an ex-husband, a boyfriend, that is statistically one who would be responsible for her disappearance. And, um, I'm sorry, I forgot your question. <laughs> Did you ever hit Okay, so, not a good look. I mean, this was just not, this was like the anti-good look. This was a forehead slapper. This was, uh, you know, hang it up, flat screen type of situation. I mean, just... Why, 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 why did you ever do that? I met Scott Peterson, November 20th, 2002. Scott told me he was not married. We did have a romantic relationship. Amber Fry was a single mother who was fixed up with Scott Peterson through a friend. She was his girlfriend and she thought she had met the man of her dreams. She was truly happy with him. He was courting her. They had a whirlwind romance. 
in the few weeks they knew each other. On the very first night, Scott meets her at the hotel and basically he's smooth, but he, he gets her to go upstairs with him just for he can sh take a quick shower and change and then they can go to dinner. Well, upstairs is, you know, I don't know, four or five dozen roses and some chocolate strawberries and some champagne. That was the start of the relationship. Re you know, when you look forward to hearing from somebody and seeing them again and that, you know, that excitement's there and you could, you know, it, you know, all felt very good. She talked about, you know, laying out and looking at the stars and Scott wanting to spend the rest of his life with her and she really thought she had Mr. Right. I really liked him and felt really good about where things were going and our conversations and time spent together. And this girl is Delulu, okay? Guys, let me know, uh, fellas out there, men, um, who is more attractive, okay? Lacey or Amber, okay? Uh, and let's consider the fact that Scott and Amber actually saw each other in person maybe a total of five times in the short period of time that they knew each other. It was mostly over phone calls that they did most of their talking and she slept with him on the very first night and immediately became like kind of you know obsessed in a way with him this was also not her first time dating a married man and becoming overly involved with a married man to the point that she ended up kind of blowing up her, her own life by getting herself entangled in in a situation like such as this so amber fry had a main character syndrome issue okay she thought that she was the reason that scott peterson had killed his wife supposedly and she just wanted to get to the bottom of it like from the beginning she was obsessed with figuring out who scott was why wasn't he calling her enough as, as as she wanted him to i mean if you go back and really look at some of her interviews and and some of the testimony she gave it's like she 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 couldn't she wouldn't stop like she just literally would not stop and it was really kind of pathetic in a way honestly going back and seeing it all and you would think the way that the media played this woman up that they had this like years long affair they were this in love couple with this super intense connection and that just wasn't the case. They had known each other for a literal month before this all occurred. So I just don't buy into that narrative whatsoever. So it didn't really look great or sit well with many, many people. This nonchalant attitude that Scott Peterson displayed. And I'll even admit, you know, my own biases about this. I, I think he looks... It looks crazy. I mean, it really does. I mean, he just, his whole attitude about the whole thing was very removed. It was just very unbothered and just kind of brought a lot of speculation to how Scott was acting. And people put a lot of stock in this. People use this as sort of the reason why his guilt seemed to be so apparent to a lot of people. And a lot of people made that judgment before actually even knowing a lot of the facts of the case. And this case really was tried in the media from day one and I think that has been a huge flaw and a huge downfall to our justice system in general since we've had this 24-hour news cycle and I just want to play for you guys one piece from one of the documentaries that we'll be looking at some of the footage from that really kind of breaks it down as to not only how this news cycle and this need for Scott to behave a certain way really fueled the hatred towards him but there was other things going on that were pretty important around the same time that people just seem to kind of forget about. When you have any story that overtakes everything else, as the Peterson case did, it is crowding out other news that's important to know about in a democracy. This strike has far-reaching ramifications, the likes of which we can't quite figure out yet. People are cutting back and forth on their TV screens between these two stories as if they should be occupying equal time in the American viewer's mind. 
President Bush said today the victory in Iraq is certain but not yet complete. We are also keeping our eyes on a developing story here in the United States. Authorities in Modesto, California uh, may make some announcements in the case of Lacey Peterson. We will take you there live when it happens. So this just kind of really highlights the sensationalism and the sort of news coverage that this was receiving in the media at the same time that one of the most important wars and political events, global events was taking place simultaneously, which was the Iraq war, which was an absolute abject failure and should have been paid more attention to. But it kind of <laughs> highlighted where the American people were at, you know? People wanted drama, people wanted this sensationalized news story, this real life soap opera that was playing out before everyone's very eyes. And you can see it pretty clearly, this um, A&E six part series, all the people that they brought on for this documentary, and one of the more interesting figures was this local journalist. And I just wanna play for you guys her reaction upon the body of Lacey Peterson being found in the San Francisco Bay there and just take a look at how she reacts. I mean, it's truly disturbing. I was at work and I got a call. It was someone close to the investigation that said, you gotta go to the San Francisco Bay right now. And I'm like, oh my God, oh my God, did they find her? What did they find? Did they find, you gotta go there now. As I'm driving, I'm now getting more information on the phone with a source who is giving me play by play on what they're finding and then reporting it as it's being told to me. Literally, I'm having a person on hold as I'm reporting it. And every time I'm going live, I'm reporting something new. They found a body. They found a torso. They don't know yet if it's male or female, just a torso. Okay, so at this point, I get chills. My adrenaline, my heart's pumping. This is big. This is finally the body. We're, 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 this, is, this is what we've been waiting for. So this is what we've been waiting for. This is big. As if it was some sort of good news event. And she was one of the more loathsome characters I found in this documentary because just her entire attitude towards this case and how she was portraying herself to be just more excited about getting the scoop and you know she would take this horrifying news of a body being found and i mean you could tell she was just like radiating energy of excitement and just sheer joy and the same thing was kind of present whenever she was notified that she would be getting an interview with scott peterson there was nothing more exciting to me than the day that scott called me to say he wanted to give me a little interview. And I just remember- Girl, you need to get out more. I was screaming. I was like, I just couldn't believe it. This is like the biggest interview. She was screaming as if she was at a Justin Bieber concert. Or, I mean, just this woman, this moment was like shocking for me to see, to, to witness a grown woman, a so-called journalist act like this. The prosecution had a pretty good case against Scott and of course one could argue that when it comes to state's evidence and witnesses and uh, specifically expert witnesses in general they have proven at least in my mind to be less and less credible as time has gone on and as we've learned more and more about the process getting opinions from these individuals you can find an expert who will pretty much agree to your point of view and whatever Point you're trying to make on the stand you just have to cycle through whatever expert witness you may need for that specific opinion and then just find the one that says what you want them to say so in my mind they're none too credible so another piece of evidence that I found uh, was surprising upon further research of this case and I thought it kind of skewed things more towards the defense Whereas I had originally thought that this piece of evidence was uh, more of a prosecutorial win, was the hair in the pliers. You know, they made the big deal about the hair that was stuck in these pliers, who they alleged were rusted closed. But if you know anything about pliers, then you know that 
oftentimes you just have to put a little force behind it and then they'll open up. And they held this up as the only piece of physical evidence, you know, because many people made the claims that there was absolutely no physical evidence. There was absolutely no forensics in this case, which is for the most part true if you ignore the hair in the pliers. Well, this was kind of, um, this was beaten back by Mark Garagos, who was Scott Peterson's lead attorney in court. And obviously because the court proceedings were not televised, many of these findings, many of these moments that happened in the courtroom, nobody knew and nobody found out about because nobody was reading court transcripts. But so hair expert Rodney Oswald disputed their theory that two hair fragments taken from pliers on Peterson's boat the only physical evidence connecting Peterson to the slaying were Lacey's. Oswald said under cross-examination that the hair came from separate sources and that he could not decisively determine whether either hair came from Lacey because the strands did not have roots. He also said the hair did not belong to Peterson. So that just goes back to what I was saying before where you can find an expert, quote unquote, big heavy quotes, on pretty much any subject matter that if you keep funneling through them, if you keep just cycling your way through them, you'll find one that's going to say what you want them to say. And that's the one that you hire and you put up on the stand to forward your narrative. So that's another reason why I feel like a lot of times these uh, testimonies of these experts, there's a lot of credibility that's put onto that testimony where I think it shouldn't be. And I think it needs to be kind of more closely evaluated and there needs to be a standard or some sort of like testing standard that it, a scientist, if they want to be a trial witness, if they want to become an expert in their field and be used in court proceedings, that they need to have some sort of ethical code of conduct or testing standard where we can't just allow each side to interview 10 different experts who claim to be an experts in a field and just hire the one that they like who's going to say what they want them to say. I think that's totally a disgusting practice and it's not conducive to carrying out justice. It's, it's, it's actually antithetical to having a legitimate and fully operational legal system that works and seeks out true justice. So I think that's one of the main reforms that we can make to our criminal justice system to tighten that up and to tighten up the jury process as well. What the Innocence Project is looking to do is to look at this brown stain that was on a mattress in a van that was found roughly a mile from the Peterson residence that the uh, investigator there is saying he doesn't feel was ever fully investigated the problem is that the science to investigate it at the time might not have been up to snuff whether it was or not or whether the prosecution had ruled it out on other grounds is what they're going to be looking at they have a few other things that they want to introduce but realistically short of coming back with some really compelling dna evidence it's going to take something really empirical and scientific here uh, to overturn what is a long-standing decision the science has come a long way, as we've seen in Idaho and yeah. Gilgo, but short of something like that, I'm feeling like the, the, uh, the investigation was fulsome, the trial was fair, and that the conviction will be upheld. Okay, I'm just reading your words now. The point is, Peterson's guilty. There's a ton of evidence stacked up against him. You stand by that? I do. That's the, that's the right decision. Okay, girl. Thanks for your thoughts. So what do you guys think about that? The burnt up van is also one of the least reported items. And even still, if you go and try to find information about this van, which maybe it, it's completely unrelated. Maybe that's why it's like a non-issue that was supposedly burnt up and was supposedly poss or possibly related to the burglary, which was a theory that was floated by the defense team that these burglars had possibly kidnapped Lacey after committing that act of burglary on their neighbor's home. And I mean, that would be extremely explosive. And I mean, what insanity would that cause if they were to be able to prove that this mattress was linked to Lacey Peterson and her DNA in, in the form of bloodstains were found on that mattress in that burnt up van? I mean, that would be blow the lid off the entire justice system, I would be shocked, but we'll see.
All right. We now know the theory of the case. Okay, here's what they're going to present um, to a judge and say, listen, we need a new trial. There was a van. Okay, an orange van. There it is. It was found a mile from Peterson's home. It was found by a Modesto fire inspector a day after Lacey Peterson went missing. So what? Well, inside the van, there was a mattress. On the mattress was a blood stain. The inspector says it was human blood. Here's what he told GMA. I don't know that I was tying the moment to Lacey. I was more tying the moment that it was human blood. It made it like this was much more important than just a, a burned vehicle that somebody was just wanting to get rid of or cover up a, a simple crime. Yeah, problem for him is, well, where were you 20 years ago? Anyway, let's bring in the yeah, News Nation hello. correspondent who's been covering the Scott Peterson case since day one, Laura Engel of News Nation. It's good to have you. Uh, so uh, give me the history on the orange van. Have you heard this before? You know, I had not heard about this particular van. We always heard about a van that was spotted across the street from Scott and Lacey's house the morning or possibly in that time frame that Lacey Peterson went missing. It was mm -hmm. white. It was tan. It was brown. It was checked out. And the people that owned it were cleared. Yeah, but I this is a, a different van. van that we are now hearing about. Right. And so all of us that have been covering this case have gone back and said, wait a minute. Do you remember this? Do you remember this? So I started making phone calls today to find out if we could find the police report or the fire incident report which I was able to just get about an hour ago. This is the incident report from the Modesto Fire Department that does in fact state that there was a van in this alley that that firefighter, Brian, talked about. And there was a report about how it was found. And I'll read you just the summation at the end. This was a fully involved van fire. There was a rag hanging out of the gas fill hole with a gas cap on the ground, but this was not the cause of the fire. There were three or more gas cans in the vehicle with evidence of flammable liquid usage in the interior of the vehicle. This was an arson fire. The battery was missing. So this all seems new. And again, mm -hmm. your question, I'm not sure where this report went in terms of whose hands it was in, but it is clearly in the archive file of the city of Modesto. Uh, I also made a phone call to the Stanislaus County Sheriff's Department. So you've got the Modesto PD, you've got two different jurisdictions, right. and they cover different areas of Modesto. And so the Stanislaus County Sheriff's Office does cover part of what's known as the airport district, where this alley was, made requests for reports from them as well. It's not clear who may have investigated this fire incident, but now we have it in our hands. And you can see that the burned out orange van uh, is just a little over a mile away from Scott and Lacey Peterson's home on Covina in Modesto. Again, this van discovered in flames the morning, Christmas morning, 2002. Right. I just don't, I mean, I, that's clearly not enough. It would have to be that they took a sample of what they believed was human right. blood, that they still have it, that they can test it, and that it is somehow connected to somebody that is relevant in the investigation. Otherwise, I don't know what, what, this, what this means. And it was, right. it's, it's also important to note that, and Detective Bueller can talk about this, but this is not a great area of town. So right. there's a lot of shady activity that has happened in this part right. of town. So a van fire, is it all that unusual? Maybe not. Uh, but it's still something that apparently people hadn't seen, hadn't talked about. Right. And now we're going to have to wait. And it should be tested. Everybody can agree. If there's something there, test it. Let's see what's yes. on that mattress. So we wait, I guess, to see and find out what the hell's on the mattress. But it is interesting to note that, you know, that the Innocence Project has decided to take on this case because, as I was saying, I mean, they just don't take on every case. And there are so many people that do need resources such as the Innocence Project. And I think it's kind of a big statement in a lot of ways. So I want to play this video from Long Crime, kind of breaking down more of the defense's side and more of the speculation as to what sort of new evidence that the Innocence Project may be looking to uncover, as well as some more little-known details from the case that were never really publicized in the way that they should have been because they may or may not have been exculpatory towards Scott or made him look like not as guilty of a person 
in the eyes of the media. And I think that it was all done this way on purpose. We're updating you in the case against convicted killer Scott Peterson, who was sentenced to life in prison for murdering his pregnant wife, Lacey, after she disappeared on Christmas Eve in 2002. Yeah. Well, the Los Angeles Innocence Project has taken up the case as the convicted killer seeks new DNA testing. You've got uh, the Los Angeles Innocence Project having shown not just an interest, but has taken on the case. And I mean, they don't take any case, right? There's plenty of cases out there and there's plenty of people, thousands who are claiming that they've been wrongfully convicted. But guess what? Of all of these cases, they've taken Scott Peterson's case and that in itself is huge and it speaks volumes. Uh, it basically means, and they usually only take cases where of individuals who have made credible claims of actual innocence. And when you read the paperwork that they filed, the documents that they filed with the court, it's very clear that they believe that he has been wrongfully convicted and they're requesting uh, for you know DNA testing on a number of items. And it's pretty clear where they're going with it as far as what the theory is. So, Brian, you've read through this. Uh, you know, we hear about, you know, I think the Innocence Project as an entity ha has some credibility. And when we hear that they've taken on a case, you think, oh, OK, let's look at that. I think a lot of people would look at this case and say, you're nuts. I mean, we've seen this tried one and a half times. Uh, we know this nationally, internationally uh, detailed case. Uh, how is all of this stuff they claim in their motion missed, misinterpreted, held back from the defense? Give me your thoughts on the things you've read in this motion. Yeah, so it's, as you said, it's three different motions that they've filed together bullet points, as you said, one to file documents under seal, one for retrying or retesting of, of evidence, or even testing evidence that was not tested to begin with uh, for DNA, and then for additional discovery or discovery that might have been lost or damaged over a period of time. But I think I read it and I'm thinking, you know what? Let's check it out. At the very least, I agree with you. Everyone who has watched this case, I, I, I will put it out there. When this case happened, I was still in high school and didn't follow it as intensely as I think everyone else uh, on the network did. But the questions that they have, the overarching theme is the investigation was narrowly focused on the guilt of Scott Peterson. They did not properly investigate, as we've heard before, the burglary across the street. That their belief is that Lacey Peterson witnessed this burglary. And they're saying they've got people who admitted to abducting her and then killing her to quote unquote, shut her up. And that the, there's this van, this orange van that witnesses identify as being at the location that was then later transported to an airport and burned. And there are presumptive tests of blood in that van. And they're asking to test that blood in the van, on the duct tape in the van, on the handles of the van, everywhere in the van and say, let's see whose DNA it is. And at least at that point for me, I'm thinking, you know what? I'm kind of curious about the blood too, because if that blood is in there and that's Lacey Peterson, I think they've got a little bit of leg room here to run. Uh, the other thing that I thought was very interesting as well was they're arguing that the science that was used to measure the femur of Connor, uh, the unborn child inside Lacey was incorrect. And that measurement was used to see when the time of death was. And they're arguing it should have been somewhere in early January, January 3rd, which feeds into their theory that Lacey Peterson was kidnapped held and then her body was dumped much later it's maybe a little sensational it's a very intriguing for me i'm not sure what to believe at this point but for me i'm saying let's test it and let's find out so the whole van thing was fascinating to me because this was one piece of evidence that i had never even heard before i mean and you guys let me know is this something that y'all knew about and i mainly mean in regards to the van being tied to this burglary that i had uh actually heard about in my previous knowledge of this case, you know, just kind of having the most basic prosecution's version of this crime was this theory that these men were spotted burglarizing a house just across the street from Lacey Peterson's house. And the defense had tried unsuccessfully to float the theory of these criminals possibly abducting Lacey. But as it would turn out, which we're about to uncover watching this last episode of this A&E series and some of the theories that have really come into play in regards to people really beginning to take a closer look at this, that this van was found burned. And this is one of the key pieces of evidence that they seek to really re-examine and take a closer look at because there would appear to have been some sort of funny business and more witnesses would come forward to to claim that they had actually seen a pregnant woman being forced into a similar looking van on the day of Lacey's disappearance, a van that would then be later discovered burnt in a different part of town. And the police would dismiss this theory as being 
non-credible because they actually went on to find these so-called burglars and they claimed that the burglary took place on the 26th and not the 24th, which if you are a criminal, you don't want to be linked in any way to a murder, whether you did it or not. So I wonder just how much credence they actually put on those statements made by the burglars that this burglary was committed two days after Lacey's disappearance as opposed to the day of, especially considering the fact that journalists and the media had begun camping out on the street the very next day after Lacey was reported as missing. So it would have been pretty hard to burglarize a home where massive amounts of media trucks and a police presence was heavy on the very street of the house that you wish to burglarize. So let's look at some of these alternative theories that were put out. And again, I will link this whole series in the description box. I would definitely suggest you guys check it out. Why? The second flaw in the state's analysis is that there was evidence from a prosecution expert, a hydrologist, and he testified to the movement of bodies in water. It was predicted by one of the title experts that if he dropped them, in this general area, this is the general area where they would wash up. But the hydrologist, he admitted that he had no expertise in the movement of bodies in water. He had not done any studies that was never a part of his education or his practice. That third part of the appeal basically covers evidence from the defense side that was excluded. The state's theory, of course, was that Scott had taken Lacey, put her in the 14-foot boat, gone out into San Francisco Bay and pushed her off the side of the boat, having attached anchors to her. The defense sought to test that theory. They got the identical boat from the identical manufacturer. They took the boat out at the identical time of year, or very similar conditions, and they tried to do an experiment. When you tried to push a body of that weight with those kinds of anchors on, the boat capsized. The judge, however, found that our experiment was not similar enough to what the prosecution's theory of what occurred, and therefore we could not introduce the tape. But. One of the more ironic twists in the trial was when the judge allowed the jury to go actually physically get inside Scott's boat. This little blue pinpoint here is basically where Scott is describing what he's seeing on Christmas Eve day. So it puts him on this south side of Brooks Island, motored from the Berkeley Marina, which is right here. He motored up this way to this point. You know, when Connor's body was found, there was twine around his neck. Mm -hmm. It was knotted. There was also a piece of tape pinning his ear down. Both that piece of twine and the piece of tape, it led different investigators to believe that Connor was potentially handled outside of Lacey's body, and that might not be something we ever have an answer to. If you scratch the surface, there is this darker, rougher edge to Modesto. Gang problems, methamphetamine, and you know, occasionally the, that crime turned violent. Scott Peterson's defense team has been considering a gruesome possibility. Their experts believe the baby may have been handled outside of Lacey's body. Scott Peterson's legal team is trying to shift blame to some murky satanic cult. I had an associate who was working on the case and he became convinced of this theory. He started running with it, and then the tabloids and cable news shows went crazy with it. I would advise Mark that he saved that for a campfire, not for a, not for a court of law. Sources say, aside from the cult theory, Peterson's attorneys are looking at other leads. The theories were so crazy. It could be a Hawaiian crime gang. It could be dope dealers. It could be a hooker stealing checks. It could be burglars. Or uh, it could be a satanic cult. And the more those arguments were made, the more obvious it was that Scott Peterson did it, because every other argument seems so outlandish. You know, you, you can say there were no Satanists involved, but Modesto police started the investigation into the Satanists. Them going out, interviewing witnesses, and all I did was pull their reports out and put this together. One of the things I discovered was that between 1999 and 2002, seven pregnant women disappeared from the area. We had three from Modesto and four within 80 miles of Modesto. And two of these victims 
Evelyn Hernandez and Lacey Peterson disappeared six months apart from each other. Like Lacey, the Bay Area woman was eight months pregnant when she disappeared. The defense believes there are similarities between the Peterson case and the Hernandez case. The Hernandez case was similar to Lacey's because she washed up on the shores of the Bay. She washed up in the same condition that Lacey did. You have to explore everything because if you're going to do a defense of somebody, you don't want to do what the police do and come in with blinders on. Because the problem is that then when you get into a courtroom, you look like the village idiot because you haven't analyzed the evidence. You don't know what the evidence is. On the Scott Peterson case, 14 years later, it gives me a sick feeling. This is one of the greatest injustices I've ever seen in my career. At 10 18, it's over. The dog is running free with the muddy leash. But that assumption, in fact, was wrong. I can tell you, in terms of the forensic evidence, that one of the most remarkable features about this case is that there is none. There's no blood evidence, there's no scratches, nothing in the house is unkept, there's no evidence of a cleanup. Uh, there's no forensic evidence at all that suggests that a crime occurred in that house, much less a murder. The reason the police weren't able to find any evidence of a murder inside this house is because no murder occurred inside this house. If you really want to know what happened to Lacey Peterson, this is the house that's important. 516 Covina. This was the home of the Medinas. The Medinas leave for their Christmas vacation on December 24th at 1033. Diane Jackson, a neighbor who lives right over here, called the police and reported that she saw a burglary in progress. I went and talked to her and she verified it with me. It was December 24th and I turned right on Convena and uh, I saw three people at the Medina's house. They were short, darker skinned. They had a van in front. They stopped doing what they were doing when I drove by and they all just looked. We have a witness that drove by the residence that lives in the area who saw a suspicious vehicle and some suspicious people. When the Modesto Police Department first released the information about the burglary, that was uh, considered a big lead. That The burglary across the street was considered a potential break in this case. I feel that it's critical to either confirm it's involved with Lacey's disappearance or that it's, it's just a burglary. Then the police came out and said that they had solved the burglary. The two people arrested basically looked at the police and said, no, we didn't do it on the 24th, we did it on the 26th. And because the police had total tunnel vision towards Scott, accepted that. We solved that burglary, found out that it in fact occurred on the 26th. The burglars, their own statements were, they took the safe out of the house, put it on the front lawn, and then moved it to a van later on. The members of the media know that that can't possibly be the case, because by December 26th, Scott's Street and Modesto was covered with press trucks. Yeah, friends and family of this young woman, Lacey Peterson, are gathering uh, at the family home. I was standing outside that house at 5 in the morning on December 26th, and there was nobody outside the front of that house. The police theory was completely inconsistent with what Diane Jackson, the eyewitness to the burglary, had seen. So now they changed the date so that nobody would think that the burglary had anything to do with the disappearance of Lacey Peterson. And Scott's jury didn't hear any of this. When the man convicted of this burglary, Stephen Todd, was interviewed by the detective, first words out of his mouth, I had nothing to do with pregnant girl. The detective, rather than following up on that line of questioning, said to this burglar, I'm not here to talk to you about the pregnant girl. I want to talk to you about the burglary. And never pursued that line of questioning. Lieutenant Aponte who was a watch commander at a state prison. A few weeks after Lacey disappeared, he had sent a tip in to the Modesto police. So I flew down, I, I talked to Lieutenant uh, Aponte, he was very cooperative. And he told me Sean Timbrink, who was in prison, was having a conversation on the phone with his brother, Adam, who is a close friend of Stephen Todd, who did the burglary. Adam said, Stephen had told him, Lacey went across the street confronted them during the burglary, and they threatened her. And when Lacey's name came up, Sean Tenbrink started screaming at the brothers, shut up, shut up, this could be monitored, we're not gonna talk about that. And Aponte knew this was significant. He taped the conversation. And he actually called it in the tip. In January of 2003, just a couple of weeks after Lacey went missing, 
Lieutenant Aponte is tipped in a very close time frame to when Lacey disappeared is, is highly significant. And he had to call twice before he got a phone call back. Lieutenant Aponte then said that he gave the Modesto police a copy of the tape. Modesto says that no police officer went and they don't have a copy of the tape. Uh, they say that in response to defense counsel's inquiry. Uh, and Lieutenant Aponte says he doesn't have a copy of the tape. Uh, so that's where we are, the tape is missing. So where is the cassette tape and why didn't Modesto Police Department enter it under a chain of command in their evidence? Who was it that called Lieutenant Aponte back? I don't have answers to that. It's baffling. This tip exculpated Scott. It tended to show that somebody else knew something about a burglary in the neighborhood and that that burglary in the neighborhood had a connection to Lacey Peterson. By the Modesto Police deep sixing this report with Tinbrink, it prevented us from being able to potentially put on a case for the defense that the burglary was directly responsible for Lacey's disappearance. Guilt or innocence should never be formed solely based on how a suspect reacts to a crime. Doing so can result in false confessions or incorrect assumptions that can have a profoundly negative effect on an ongoing investigation. But as much as we may want for criminality to be solely determined based on scientific-based forensics, the reality of solving crimes often does involve observations that are centered around intuition, experience, and common sense, as well as observing the evidence as a whole. It is true that not everyone reacts the same way to trauma, and that some people do not express grief in the same way. But there was a segment of this documentary that left me questioning the intent of this series as a whole. Maureen Orth works for Vanity Fair and is one of the pundits seen throughout the series, and she begins to chastise the American public's way of handling grief whenever these kinds of cases are picked up by the 24-hour news cycle. One of the things that was interesting to me as a journalist was what matters are people's feelings and how terrible they feel and if they cry it's so much better. It's really just having a national pageant of grief in which everybody can participate and stare at all the grief and the tears and speculate about all the salacious details. And, you know, although he'll go on, this is, uh, by the way, this is from Behind Criminal Minds, the YouTube channel. Definitely check them out. I've featured them in my videos before. They do really good work really put out really good content but he'll go on to kind of criticize her for saying this i think that she's absolutely right and i think that's one of the more sinister and one of the problems with our media and the way that it has intertwined itself with the criminal justice system and has been proven in my opinion to be a, a net negative and and has done harm to the way that justice is carried out and the way that people perceive you know grieving families or it's not enough it's not enough emotion it's too much emotion i do think that there is things that can be inferred from that but i think that should be up to the police and the family to determine and to to observe it's not for like the the term pageant of grief was so like fabulous to me because it's like it's it hits the nail on the head and it's it, it, that's what the news pundits want. That's what these networks want. They do want to parade victims' families up there on the stage, have them cry for the ratings. They want to exploit these people's emotions. And it's it's disgusting. I mean, she's right in that regard. Um, but he does have some criticism for her saying this. So, uh, and, I, and I found it to be interesting as well. But I do just want to point out that it's true what she says, but it's also not entirely truthful to say that you cannot tell anything about someone's guilt or innocence if they don't react the right way. I do think that there is an actual standard, at least on certain level, to how one should react to this sort of scenario and I think that the way that Scott reacted was completely insane and just very much out of line with that and you can be holding it all together you can you know that's why I said it's, it's more up to the family 
and those around you and the police to kind of observe these things on a more personal and private basis. But if your family starts looking at you sideways, like Lacey's family eventually was, and it seemed like from the very beginning kind of was noticing his behavior, then that is indicative of something. There are certain cases that you just connect with. Is that the healthiest thing, though, for the American public to, you know, have this pageant of, of grief, you know, this mass, like, visual for a stranger? I mean, yes, we as human beings, we have empathy. It exists. And, but it's just become so salacious and so rampant. We've seen this in, in many cases that get this publicity. I mean, if you look at the courtroom, outside the courtroom after the Scott Peterson verdict was announced. I mean, these people go crazy. It's like they're cheering for a celebrity. It's like they're, I mean, they just, they cheer with such glee and happiness. At the end of the day, it's still a man who was sentenced to death and a woman and her child that she was carrying who ultimately lost their lives. And people are outside of a courthouse with signs, t-shirts, I mean, all kinds of propaganda and me memorabilia and everything else cheering for a man being sentenced to death. Um, you know, and I, I don't disagree with being able to watch court proceedings. I think that's part of our fundamental rights as Americans. And I think that it's a very important part of government, but is there a need to cheer when a man gets sentenced to death? I'm not so sure. I think retribution is important and I think justice is important, but the glee and the, I don't, uh, the, the very like cheapening feel to something like that, a display like that is just a disservice, I feel like, to the uh, criminal justice system. But it goes back to the totality. I mean, this case cannot be looked at by any one piece of evidence. I firmly believe that there's no way that there's one big smoking gun either direction. And if you only look at it on, if you only look at anything on a molecular level within this case, you're doing yourself and Lacey Peterson a disservice because it's impossible to determine that way. You have to look at the totality of facts from either side and determine whether there's actual plausible deniability, reasonable doubt, whether or not you can definitively say you have no doubt in your mind that Scott Peterson was the one who killed Lacey or, or not. I mean, that's the, that's the burden of proof. So I want to go over some of the prosecution's case and what they used and highlighted as their key pieces of evidence in this case to drive home this point that Scott was guilty of, of murdering not only his wife Lacey but his unborn child Connor. I wanted to watch both sides of this and no one better or more biased towards the prosecution than uh, Nancy Grace who is like a dog with a bone whenever she thinks she's right about something. So what is the evidence that convinces you the most that Scott Peterson actually killed his wife, Lacey. Number one, he places himself at the scene of the murders within hours after Lacey and Connor were dumped in the cold waters of the San Francisco Bay. Uh, forget about the affair, a lot of men cheat, but either you think he's guilty or he's clairvoyant. Just before Lacey goes missing, he tells his new mistress, Amber Fry, this is my first Christmas as a widow. I just lost my wife. And bam, a few days later, it was true. Shortly after Lacey's disappearance, a missing poster had gone out through the entire community, being shared absolutely all over Modesto. This is the poster that most people saw in their community, on the news, and all over the internet. A short time later, a reward was offered in connection to a lead that would solve her case a monetary award of half a million dollars. Now on the missing poster, you may notice that it says that she was wearing a white long sleeve shirt and black pants. And wouldn't you know it, the many independent witnesses claim to have seen Lacey wearing exactly that outfit long after Scott had left their house to go on a pleasant day of fishing. 
There is just one very big problem with all of that. And that's the fact that when Lacey's remains were found, she was wearing beige pants, not black. So these alleged sightings didn't even match the clothing that she was actually wearing at the time. Oh, and one other thing. Lacey's OBGYN testified that she had already stopped walking their dog because she had an episode where she nearly fainted in the park several weeks before. Her yoga teacher, her neighbors, her friends, and her mother all corroborated the fact that Lacey had stopped walking Mackenzie several weeks earlier. So I just wanted to present this as well because this was another argument that was brought up in this A&E series that whenever I first heard it, and whenever I was first watching this docu-series, I gave a lot of credence to it. And I was like, wow, like, this seems very sketchy. Like, why was this not more of a factor in Scott Peterson's trial? And it was very convincing. But once I saw the autopsy footage and the crime scene photos, the the site where Lacey's body was found, and you can clearly see in the corner describes Lacey as having worn white or tan looking pants, not black pants. And the shirt that was found there on the scene was not a white shirt. I mean, it just, it goes completely against the narrative of her, what she was last seen in, which was described as a white shirt and black yoga pants. And that was printed on the posters and reported in the media. And wouldn't you know it, that most of the witnesses, if not all, that came out and claimed that they saw Lacey on a walk at the time that they claimed they saw her, described her wearing these clothes. And it discredits all of those people. And this is the reason why those people were never presented as witnesses by the defense in Scott Peterson's trial. And that is very damning, in my opinion, because this has been mentioned and this is constantly brought forth as you know a piece that is favorable to scott and the defense that i think is has been misrepresented in the other direction but i think that these 11 witnesses have been misrepresented and kind of used as a gotcha sort of piece of evidence that once you scratch the surface a bit and really look at it it's totally un like non credible, and it seems just like a a red herring, and it seems like another case of people having something planted in their mind and then running with that. And it's it's a reason why, oftentimes, witness testimony, firsthand witness testimony, people who see something is not credible because people misrepresent things, people misremember, people will hear something, a seed will get planted in their head, and then they'll regurgitate it as if it's actual fact, and it's not. The 11 supposed witnesses were a non-factor. They were not actual leads, they were not anything that needed to be given any credence to, and people that try to bring it up or people that try to use this as a argument against Scott's guilt are just uninformed about the facts of the matter. And I, I can say that I was one of those people, you know, you really have to dive deep into these cases to know all these things and being uninformed or being ignorant is not, is not this huge insult. It's just to say that, you know, a lot of these things, a lot of these cases require research and they require you to really look into all of the things and to have a basic understanding and most people just don't and that's what's so dangerous about this is that you have people that it's it's okay to express your opinion on a base level but to adamantly and with their whole chest people get up on these internets and say these crazy things and defend these crazy people it's a problem. So the prosecution also called on several witnesses, including Lacey's relatives and Amber Fry, who was his mistress. And they had a strictly circumstantial case and they were trying to show that Scott had shown little emotion during and after Lacey's disappearance. They played phone calls that had been recorded by Amber Frey, which again, doesn't really sit right with me now that I'm thinking back on it because 
they were using Amber Frey to kind of circumvent and get around Scott Peterson's Fifth Amendment to not incriminate himself and, you know, his his other rights to basically have a fair shake of it and to not be spied upon in this manner. And I just think it's really shady the way that they used his mistress in the ways that they did by having her record and work as sort of a undercover agent for them in the early stages of this and then later used her at that press conference to kind of I think shake and rattle his cage and to get the public turned against him and this in turn would in fact turn Lacey's family against him who up until that point had been fully supportive of Scott and had been adamant that they thought that he was not involved but once Amber Frey came out and released that press conference with the PD there that they completely turned on him and this is when things kind of all started to come crumbling down for Scott. Uh, I have not been traveling in the last couple of weeks. Well, I have, I've lied to you that I've been traveling. Okay. Uh, the girl I got married to, her name is Lacey. Mm-hmm. She disappeared just before Christmas. Mm-hmm. For the past two weeks, I've been in Modesto with her family and mine, searching for her. Okay. She just disappeared, and no one knows okay, now, where she's been. Scott? And I, I, I can't tell you more because I, I need you to be protected from the media and I honor Okay. Okay, they are amazing. Scott, are, yeah. you, are you listening? I am. You came to me uh, earlier in December and told me that you had lost your wife. What was that about? She, I mean, she's uh, alive. What? She's alive. Where? She's alive? Where? In the desk, Now, I know, I... Uh, this is the hardest I, I wanted to tell you first. I, it was a, you need to protect yourself from the media. Okay. Okay, if you've been watching the news at all, well, you haven't. Um, the media has been telling everyone that I had something to do with her disappearance. So the past two weeks I've been hunted by the media. And I just, I don't want you to be involved in this to protect yourself. I know that I, well, I destroyed, and I, God, I hope, I hope so much that this doesn't hurt you. How could it not affect me? It does. And I just, how, I, how can you possibly think that this would not affect me? Never, I know it does. So they would go on to play those phone calls between Amber Frey and Scott in court. In the calls, Peterson had told Frey he didn't want children and he was actually thinking about a vasectomy, that he was not married, then would later go on to admit that he had been married, but his wife had passed away and this would be his first Christmas without her. Prosecutors also brought forth that alleged Peterson was trying to flee to Mexico when he was arrested noting he was carrying nearly 15,000 cash and had dyed his hair blonde and grown a goatee. So they also called a hydrologist who said their bodies would have likely been dumped in the area where Scott said he'd gone fishing that morning. And they also claimed that Scott made cement acres to weigh his wife's body down in the bay. They also said blood was found on the couple's bedspread and on the door of Scott's truck. But Peterson, in an interview with ABC's Diane Sawyer, said the blood on his truck was easily explainable by the manual labor he did. Lacey was in a body bag on a gurney in the center of the room as Dr. Peterson quickly dictated his notes to Sandy concerning the x-rays. He nudged the gurney snug against the metal table and began locking the wheels as he spoke. There had been some visible injury to three of Lacey's ribs and her scapula, but the doctor saw no indication they'd been damaged by a weapon. Otherwise, Dr. Peterson indicated nothing remarkable on the x-ray films, aside from a cluster of white spots he later determined to be mineral deposits. 
He locked the final wheel on the gurney and checked the clock, asking Sandy to mark the time at 6.30 p.m. And because Lacey was still technically a Jane Doe, she confirmed the tag number as Dr. Peterson unzipped the bag. He was immediately struck by the wide range of post-mortem change present in Lacey's body and anticipated a challenge right away. But he was also surprised to see she'd been collected in the prone position as he transferred her to the exam table. It's unusual for a patient to be transported face down, but Dr. Peterson used the opportunity to examine Lacey's bra and unfasten it before turning her over. Articles of clothing often have to be cut off during an autopsy. However, it's preferable to undress a patient in the customary way, whenever possible. The bra remained intact and secured in the normal position around her torso. And after Nelson noted the Bali brand and the size 36C from the tag, Dr. Peterson unfastened the two hook and eye closures. He began every autopsy face to face with his patient. And once the bra was removed, he turned Lacey onto her back. Starting an exam from the front allowed him easier access to the abdomen, chest, and brain, the three regions of the body where he would typically spend the most time. But Lacey's remains were so horribly maimed, there wasn't much left for the doctor to examine. It was gruesomely obvious before she was turned that her vital organs were no longer present in either the chest or abdominal cavity. Her upper body was essentially skeletal, and Dr. Peterson could see the spine through the ribcage. Not one of her limbs remained whole, and Lacey's head was missing entirely, along with most of the vertebrae in her neck. The remaining soft tissue was in dreadful condition as well, but Dr. Peterson felt the damage would have been worse if not for the slight protection of Lacey's clothes. However, her bra was the only item that hadn't been reduced to scraps or stripped away entirely. The elastic around the waist and legs kept Lacey's size 7 jockey panties in place, but the fabric over the back panel was no longer intact. Nelson recorded the motherhood brand and size small he found printed on the tag of Lacey's pants, noting that the zipper, button, and drawstring closures on the front were all still present. But that's where the viable fabric ended, and the portions below the crotch were shredded to ribbons that didn't reach her thighs. The threading between the legs separated, forming the mesh of nylon webbing where Dr. Peterson found the stony mineral deposits he'd seen on the x-ray. The level of deterioration forced Nelson to guess at the original color of the pants. He settled on tan, but so little of them remained, he considered whether they may have been shorts. Until he found a mass of fibers stuck in the decay of Lacey's right calf bone that told him otherwise. Nelson noted where he'd found the fabric on the lower right fibula when he filed his report and packaged the pants for evidence, but he was unable to inspect the left calf for the same fibers because it had been severed. The exposed tibia and fibula bones jutted out from Lacey's right knee and her right foot was gone, but the left leg was missing completely from the knee down. Both arms were disarticulated at the elbow and her upper torso and biceps were essentially skeletal, aside from a few strips of remaining muscle and the fat discovered under her bra. But the damage didn't end there. And after completing the long list of her missing limbs, Dr. Peterson noted just one small patch of Lacey's flesh that survived her time in the water. The tiny piece of skin was attached to her upper thigh, and the doctor made note of the stark difference in postmortem change observed on the lower body versus her torso. The skin, fat, and muscle had all been stripped from most of the upper chest and back, exposing the breastbone, sternum, clavicles, and ribs, a few of which were damaged. The collarbones and scapulae were visible as well, and Dr. Peterson noted some damage to the edge of the right shoulder blade. The chest and abdominal cavities were both empty, and the heart and lungs were absent, along with the liver, spleen, pancreas, both kidneys, and the intestines. The devastating condition of Lacey's body sent a shock through the room, overwhelming several of the seasoned officers present. But for Dr. Peterson, the extensive trauma was far from unexpected. In fact, her missing limbs, organs, skin, and muscle tissue painted an accurate picture of a body left to the mercy of the San Francisco Bay. Lacey's brutal passage through the ruthless bay waters cast away any semblance of her vibrance and beauty, but it hadn't claimed everything. And by some miracle, she'd been able to protect what was most important to her long after her death. The only vital organ to survive Lacey's depredation was her uterus, a discovery that sent another tangible ripple of emotion through the room. And as Dr. Peterson examined it, several important elements became evident. The size and condition of Lacey's womb showed signs of her late stage pregnancy, further confirming her identity for the officers surrounding the table. But Dr. Peterson was also able to conclusively confirm that she'd never given birth. The uterus was still in its natural anatomic position, with its attachments to the pelvis still intact. It measured 23 centimeters, a little over 9 inches, and weighed 263 grams, just over half a pound. But it was also quite thin, at most measuring just 2 millimeters thick. The absence of the abdominal wall above the belly button caused the uterus to become exposed, which led to the fundus, or top portion, being torn open. The tissue was abraded around the opening, the edges were soft and crumbly, and there was no evidence of animal feeding or an incision. Dr. Peterson concluded that the fundus had more or less been scraped open as it decomposed, explaining why Lacey's uterus was empty. There were no remnants of the placenta or the umbilical cord, but there was evidence of her late-term pregnancy and solid proof that she'd never delivered a baby. The base of the uterus remained attached and seated in the pelvis. 
the birth canal was closed and appeared normal, showing no signs of a vaginal delivery. But as you may have guessed by now, what I found was entirely different. On so many different occasions, Scott's supporters say that Scott decided to go fishing that morning, then he came home to an empty house and immediately began to notify everyone that Lacey had seemingly disappeared into thin air. But I'm starting to notice a pattern in the entirety of their claims, because the notion that Scott decided to go fishing that morning is entirely and completely untrue. In all the documentaries that I've seen implying the innocence of Scott Peterson, I have never once heard them tell the whole truth about this specific claim. Because in actuality, Scott purchased his fishing license on December 20th, four entire days before he actually went fishing. So it wasn't a previously unplanned trip that he decided to take that morning because the license that he previously purchased was only good for December 23rd and 24th. The day he went fishing was literally the last day that he could legally fish on the marina on his new boat. So this is one of those pieces of evidence about this case in relation to this case that was it's just one of these hard to find nuggets of gold that you know we touch on a few of these throughout the course of this video and this was one of the ones that i found to be most surprising because it's like i had never heard this information before either uh the fact that you know there was a big um, to do about the fishing trip and whether or not it was an impromptu like you know there was many claims made about none of his family knew about this boat did Lacey even know about this boat you know it was a big point of contention it seemed like something that was a, a bit sneaky and I just don't know for what reason why and whenever I first kind of started to question the boating uh narrative or the people who who use this as as a testament to Scott's guilt and trying to say that, oh, it's weird that he changed his plans for that day and decided to all of a sudden go fishing and didn't really tell people that these were his plans, tried to kind of like cover it up. I was like, well, to me, that's not that weird. Even if you can make the argument that he was trying to keep the boat a secret until after Christmas because it was supposed to be maybe some sort of family surprise or what have you. You can try to make that argument, but in my opinion, he got the fishing license on the 20th for the 23rd and the 24th. And the day that Lacey was quote unquote missing, according to him. The public's response was somehow an overreaction. It completely takes away everything we've learned about Scott after Lacey's disappearance. Scott Peterson wasn't merely aloof, smiling at wildly inappropriate moments because his actions speak louder than anything he has to say. He lacked empathy for someone he claimed to love and routinely failed to show any sign that he actually cared about Lacey being gone. Within a few weeks of Lacey's disappearance, he contacted a real estate agent to put their house on the market. Long before anyone knew that she was deceased, he was already selling their home with everything in it, furnished with all of Lacey's furniture. Additionally, Scott ordered hardcore adult content that was only viewable in their living room just days after she went missing. Really think about that for a second. He orders an extremely explicit adult television channel to his living room TV while still expecting his nearly full-term pregnant wife to come home. And oh, don't forget the fact that he canceled those channels on the same day that police executed a search warrant at his house. But wait, there's more. Within a few weeks of her disappearance, he sold her car. Why would someone who is looking for his wife, who claims over and over that she will come home safe and sound, why would he sell her only form of transportation? And that's another very big L for Scott Peterson and a very bizarre twist to this whole disturbing case you know and this this question of his guilt or innocence just it, it just diminishes everything that he claims you know in in maintaining his innocence for all of these years and if you hear him on the phone if you hear him on these taped conversations where he's like adamant about he wants to find Lacey he's he wants to bring her home he, he's hoping that she's still alive why would you sell her car 
Like, it's one thing I can see maybe selling the house. Uh, you know, maybe if you really did think that something bad happened to her and you knew you weren't at fault. I, I could see selling the house. Yes. But selling her car? Uh, it makes no sense to me. To me, I can't justify or rationalize that on any level. And it doesn't stop there either. He then spent months refusing to give her parents any of her childhood keepsakes. And then once Lacey and Connor were found, he wouldn't give police her dental information so that they could verify it was her through her dental records. Instead, he told police that he couldn't remember who her dentist was, despite the fact that they went to the same dentist. Oh, and let's not forget the fact that he was having an affair with Amber Fry. But while Scott was having an affair with Amber, he also made plans to raise her daughter with her, even gifting her a book to Amber's daughter that had originally been gifted to Lacey at her baby shower. Really stop for a second and listen to what I just said. Scott and Lacey Peterson had been gifted a book for their son Connor at Lacey's baby shower. And during a time when Lacey was missing and still believed to be alive, he gives that book for his unborn son to his mistress's daughter? If he believed Lacey was ever coming home, why in the world would he have done that? So this is another piece that I found to be interesting. And, and after really exploring and kind of doing, looking at this from all different angles, I kind of agree with the defense on this one. And, you know, I, I will have to say that I don't believe for a second that Amber Frey was a motive, a, a legitimate, plausible motive to have murdered his wife because it makes absolutely no sense. And I'm not saying that he didn't have any motive. I'm just saying that to me, that was not the, that was not his reason for wanting to get rid of his wife. He had cheated on Lacey many times before. He was actively cheating on her with more than just Amber Frey as well. He was cheating on her with other women and there was no reason for him to get rid of her due to the simple fact that he wanted to continue a relationship with Amber. He, he would have done that and was doing that anyways. And this idea that you know, he didn't want kids makes no sense either because, you know, why would somebody go from having a beautiful wife who has your baby, is pregnant with your son, and you're, you know, a guy and you have this bombshell wife who is Lacey Peterson, pregnant with your son, why would you then pivot to Amber Frey, who, I'm sorry, is not as attractive as Lacey, you know, whatever everyone has their own preferences you may you may disagree to me she's not even close and she already has a young daughter who i think is like one and a half years old a baby why would you then want to get rid of one for the other it makes absolutely no sense in my mind i mean you're so you're gonna trade off a, a baby who is yours who is a, who's a male child and go raise a woman's 18 month old girl, daughter who, who doesn't belong to you and downgrade your wife from, a, you know, a hot piece of ass, you know, I'm sorry to be crude, but, and go to Amber who I'm sorry, was like half as attractive as Lacey, in my opinion. It just makes no sense to me. But one theory that did make sense, this was floated by a, a podcaster who proposed a theory that makes somewhat more sense than uh, Scott killing Lacey Peterson for a woman who he had met a literal month, okay? He knew Amber Fry for one month before Lacey's death or her disappearance. Okay, please tell me and try to convince me that a man is going to kill his wife, his beautiful wife, with pregnant with his son for a five with a who was a whore arguably a whore amber fry i'm sorry was arguably a, a fast whore okay just calling it like i see it who is strapped down with a one and a half year old baby girl you know god bless her i'm not saying she's like completely you know just a throwaway i mean she's a attractive young lady but she's just not comparable and it's like 
please tell me in what world that makes sense. He met, he meets her and then falls so in love with her and wants to raise her child so bad that he's just got to get rid of his own wife. Uh, no, but this, eh, you're getting closer. It still really doesn't make a ton of sense, but this is a little bit closer to ringing true to me. So this person is alleging that he thinks that Scott had a midlife crisis, if you will, when he learned that he was going to be a father. He goes on to say, during this crime con, most people have said that Scott just wanted to get away from the marriage, but the murder of Lacey Peterson was all about the unborn baby. Jones explained that in her opinion, Peterson is, was, and will always be a classic example of a sociopath. He was also considered the golden boy of his family, who in the eyes of his parents could do no wrong. Since birth, Peterson was doted upon and placed on a pedestal, but with a new baby on the way, the attention would no longer be focused on Peterson, at least not in the way he was comfortably accustomed to. The excessive attention, coupled with Scott's narcissistic and sociopathic traits, created a ticking time bomb that exploded when he saw that he would no longer be top priority when his son, Baby Connor, arrived. It wasn't Amber Frey. He only knew her two and a half weeks. He was a serial cheater and had been caught before. No, this was about Baby Connor. Scott played the role so well, he had everyone around him fooled, even Lacey. He couldn't handle the attention being taken away from him. I mean, he was lying to her throughout the whole entire time. And I think that a lot of the weird behavior and a lot of the guilty seeming posturing that was coming from Scott Peterson, I think a lot of it had to do with him not wanting the media to get a hold of his affairs and to get a hold of this woman or some of the other women he was dealing with. And I think that that made him so awkward and it made him feel so sketched out by the possibility of the media uncovering the fact that he was a serial cheater and had been cheating on his pregnant wife and how it was going to make him look that he was more concerned with hiding that than he was about anything having to do with Lacey's disappearance. I don't know, just it, it didn't look good and it made him look a hundred times more guilty than if he would have just came out with it right from the very beginning and been upfront about the fact that he was a piece of shit, kind of. And he was being a piece of shit to Lacey at the time for disappearance, but if you really had nothing to do with it, being a piece of shit is one thing. Being a murderer is a completely other thing. On the day of his arrest, Scott claims that he was running from the media, trying to avoid their incessant efforts to tail him. We now know that law enforcement was in fact tailing him that day, and while he was being pursued, Scott would get out of his vehicle and yell, why don't you just arrest me already? Later that day, Scott would be arrested by law enforcement as he continued to drive erratically, which law enforcement believed was his attempts to shake their tail and flee the country. In his vehicle, law enforcement found the following, survival gear, a tent, a shovel, a gun, a knife, Viagra, sleeping pills, various camping gear, over $10,000 in cash, including Mexican pesos, four cell phones, and his brother's ID. Police also believe that his family had made efforts to help Scott flee the country after Scott's mother had given him $10,000 shortly after Lacey and Connor were found. But it wasn't until recently that it was revealed that Scott Peterson had also been found with a map of Amber Fry's workplace. Ooh. Law enforcement believed at the time that Scott had planned to end the life of Amber Fry because she would pose a considerable problem for him if and when his case went to trial. During the trial of Scott- Oh my goodness. Another nugget, okay, that I had never heard before and is very insane. I mean, what you doing, Scott? What, with the map? What's the map? What's that about? And then, you know, the trying to evade these vehicles that were following him, whether or not he thought they were media or police, I, I don't really care either way. I think he was trying to, like, lose the tail that was following him. And he was trying to just go play golf with his dad and his brother that day. But nevertheless, I think that it's, it is possible, considering what they found on him, 
in his in his vehicle, which they just detailed. I mean, the Viagra, the Viagra Scott, and uh, yeah, and the tent, all that. It it doesn't look good. It does not look good at all. What I mean, what were you doing with all of that? Very bizarre, in my opinion. And they tried to explain it away, and the explanation sounded plausible to me. But when you look at the totality of the facts and the the map of Amber Fry's workplace, I'm looking very sideways at you. I don't know what you need a map of Amber Fry's workplace for. That seems a little cuckoo. And that's something that I had not heard until I watched this video. And... It's insane. I mean, it really is. I want to now get into the most recent development in this case. Um, the fact that the Innocence Project of LA, and if you guys aren't familiar with the Innocence Project, they're lawyers and other legal-minded people who have made it their mission to really delve into these high-profile or even some more low-profile cases in which people have either maintained their innocence, which Scott has always done, or people who have just been given an unfair shake by the criminal justice system. And they go and sift through these cases in order to prove the innocence of these individuals. And they have been very successful in their endeavors. And their most recent person that they have decided to take on is none other than Scott Peterson. The L.A. Innocence Project is taking up the case of one of the most high-profile convicted murderers in the country, according to what his attorney is telling NBC News. The group wants to get new evidence on Scott Peterson from his original trial that happened back in 2004. And if you remember that, it was major news. It's when Peterson was convicted of killing his pregnant wife. It was a huge case for years, really on an international level because of all these layers of drama around it all, from the mysterious circumstances around his wife's disappearance to a hidden relationship to a rogue juror who lied about her own history of abuse to get on that panel that initially found him guilty. Peterson pleaded not guilty and his legal team has always said he's innocent. His lawyers tried to get him a new trial a couple years ago, but a judge denied that request in 2022. Liz Kreutz is joining us now. So what is happening here? What would the aim be? New evidence and then what? Hey, Holly. Yeah, I mean, this is a pretty stunning development for this case that's now, uh, you know, happened two decades ago at this point. And it essentially uh, means that the L.A. Innocence Project, a group that specializes in providing pro bono legal services to people that may have been wrongfully convicted, believes that there may be enough evidence to show that Scott Peterson maybe didn't do it, which is pretty stunning given the fact that this has gone through, his trial has gone through many appeals that have uh, always been overturned. His attorneys have tried in the past to say because of jury misconduct that there should be a retrial that was dismissed. But we just were pouring through these documents that were filed by the LA Innocence Project. Uh, looking through them, they are saying that they believe Scott Peterson's state and federal constitutional rights were violated during the trial, including a, quote, claim of actual innocence that is supported by newly discovered evidence. So that is what is fascinating. They're saying there's potentially new evidence to show that he may be innocent. What that evidence is, we do not know. They are asking for, um, uh, the attorneys are asking for some new evidence, some of it related to witnesses, some of it related to a potential burglary that may have happened around the time of the murder in their neighborhood. So a lot of questions here, Hallie, but, but very interesting to see what, what could happen here. And it is yet another twist, Liz, in a case that, as we mentioned, has had so many over the last couple of decades. Yeah, exactly. I mean, first of all, Scott Peterson was on death row. He had been sentenced to death. He was able to get that overturned. So now he's sentenced to life in prison. Uh, and then his attorneys also uh, tried, as we mentioned, to get his uh, case retried with this jury misconduct allegation. That was overthrown. But he has maintained his innocence. He continues to maintain his innocence. Big development here with the LA Innocence Project taking it on, but I will say there's been some really interesting reaction, Hallie, with a lot of people saying, wow, of all the people for the LA, mm. for the Innocence Project to take on, some people have said, why are they taking on this trial? There's so many other people uh, that perhaps could use these resources. So it really makes you wonder what, what they have. Liz Kreutz, live for us there in LA. More to come potentially on that, I know, in the days and weeks to come. Liz, thank you. Lastly, we are going to look at a trend that is surfacing in the true crime genre. 
The problem that is becoming apparent is that after a conviction, a slew of keyboard detectives and opportunists pop up to try and prove that the justice system has failed. No cases have made this phenomenon clearer than the cases of Stephen Avery and Adnan Syed. Millions of dollars have been made off their names in the form of podcasts and documentaries. The proceeds from these productions are not allowed to directly benefit the people convicted due to the Son of Sam laws. States established the Son of Sam legislation in response to claims that serial killer David Berkowitz, also known as Son of Sam, had received financial offers from publishers to tell his story. Son of Sam laws were created to prohibit killers from profiting from the sale of their stories. So, who is making the money, and who is bolstering their own image by playing the innocent card on behalf of convicted killers? Syed, whose legal journey became known internationally oh, after the hit podcast. Why isn't he wiping that tear away? Nobody has anything to say about that. This freak, he was released by some activist group that, you know, sought to find, I mean, a lot of times these activist groups who portray themselves as like real serious people, they just, they, they pick apart these cases and they find technical or legal loopholes or mistakes that were made that are minute that could get someone's case dismissed on a technicality. And that's what they use to exonerate people. It's not true, actual, provable evidence of innocence. It's oftentimes, if you look at these activist-led efforts to free certain people, and I'm thinking like Kim Kardashian's efforts and things like that, it's not on a, on a true, innocent person has been wrongfully convicted basis. It's, uh, what can we get away with? How can we find a loophole that we could use to free this person who we feel aligns with us ide ideologically. Syed has always maintained his innocence, and in September, Baltimore Circuit Judge Melissa Finn ordered his conviction overturned and released him from prison. Syed's biggest supporter was Rabia Chowdhury, a family friend, and according to her own website, Rabia Chowdhury is an attorney, advocate, and author of the New York Times best-selling book, Adnan's Story, and executive producer of a four-part HBO documentary series, The Case Against Adnan Syed. Rabia is also co-producer and co-host of the podcasts, The 45th, The Hidden Gin, Nighty Night, and Undisclosed. Chowdhury, with the certain conclusion of the Syed case, has now found a new cash cow, Scott Peterson. As on Redditor commented, money, money, money. And wouldn't you know it, one of the biggest um, exploitations came from none other than Amber Fry, who wrote a book. She became a porn star, I believe, at one point. Uh, she developed this movie or this series uh, called Witness. I mean, she's done countless interviews. Like, she has m gotten her coint, honey, from this case. And uh, she's been, I think, the only one who has been able to, which is really very telling, if you ask me. So guys, what do you think about this case? It's truly heartbreaking loss of life, as is any murder. I mean, anytime a family loses a loved one, it's completely devastating. And it's something that can never be made right. Even if you end up convicting the correct person and you put the person who was responsible in jail for the rest of their lives or even give them the death penalty, it still doesn't fulfill and make that loss any better. Nothing ever will. And this case really hit me researching this after thinking I knew the story, after thinking I had all the facts. Scott Peterson, I was convinced, had been rightly convicted and there was no other really question about it. But as I've come to realize over doing videos like this and researching other true crime stories and just my experiences with the government and other things, you know, in my life, I've come to realize that things aren't always so cut and dry. And in this case in particular, after all the research that I did, I think I've come to the point where I, I, I do, I feel in my heart believe that Scott 
did do this now however if i was on that jury if i was one of those jury members and you know simply looking at what i presented here and what i know to be true and i'm sure that there's plenty of things that were presented to the jury that i don't know and that you can only glean from having been on the jury but as it stands right now i think that there is reasonable doubt in this case and i do think that it was not enough to convict him of first degree murder just based on based on the way that the law is supposed to be executed in this country and i know a lot of people don't like to hear that i know a lot of people want to decide these things based on emotion and a lot of times we're really we get ramped up by the media to really get invested in these cases and without even knowing all the facts definitively and without really understanding the way that the law is supposed to be followed, and especially in a court of law, when you're talking about taking someone's freedom, this is why we have things like innocent until proven guilty, and the burden of proof on the state being so high as it is. And this is why we have reasonable doubt and acquittals and things of that nature. I mean, it is, it is the state's job, if they are going to bring charges that would take away someone's freedom, to prove that case beyond a reasonable doubt. And if they don't have it, they shouldn't waste taxpayers' money and bring a trial. And a lot of times they're pressured into doing that because of public outrage, because of people's raw emotions. And, you know, it's a double-edged sword because sometimes people want to see justice and rightly so, but it's, it's another, it's another tough case. I think the same thing is true of Alex Murdoch. I think like, in my heart, I, I do feel like he had something to do with the murders of his wife and his son. But I think that there was plenty of reasonable doubt in that case. Enough to, uh, I feel, either, you know, convict him on lesser charges or to give him an acquittal based on the fact that the state didn't prove their case beyond reasonable doubt. And I think the same is true in this case here. So, but that's just my opinion. Um, I'm open to... Anything that could happen, I, like I said, I want to see what the Innocence Project is going to present. And I'm curious to see where this goes, guys. But I want to know what your thoughts are. What are your opinions on this case? Did they change from when you first started watching this video? And if you guys are still here, thank you so, so much, guys. I really appreciate y'all for sticking around throughout this whole long-ass video. Y'all are the best if you're still here. What are you doing if you're not subscribed? Please hit that subscribe button. Like the video if you like it. Give me a comment, guys, and y'all stay safe out there, guys, because it's a crazy world. And until next time, I will see y'all later. Bye.